Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar entitled Build an Employee's Benefit Package and Implement Virtual Tools for the 2021 Open Enrollment Season, hosted by Triton Benefits and HR Solutions. Triton is a group health brokerage and HR firm serving businesses small to large across the nation. My name is Melissa and I am the Director of Sales and an Employee Benefits Specialist. Today, we are very excited to have hundreds of business owners, HR, and benefits specialists joining us from across the country to learn more about employee benefit packages and virtual tools for an effective open enrollment. This webinar was created to provide guidance and insight during a very special and unique time. Numerous factors have gone into the development of this presentation, such as the impact of COVID, new 2021 trends, and the all-important focus on keeping your company financially sound and your employees healthy. And as stated, we will address key virtual strategies to implement your open enrollment program. We also have a special open enrollment guide that we will send to you on how to best communicate with your employees during the open enrollment season. Today we have three presenters. Steve Rosenthal, the President and CEO of Triton Benefits and HR Solutions, who has been a benefit and HR specialist for over 30 years. Triton is his third successful privately held company. Next presenter is Tyler Hirsch, Regional Vice President of Pareto Health, a specialist in cost containment strategies and programs. And last but not least, it's myself, Melissa Cook, the Director of National Sales for Triton and Benefits Triton and a benefit specialist. One piece of housekeeping before we get started, all questions, please type them in the chat feature. We will source them and answer if time allows and personally get back to you with the answer. With hundreds of participants today, we will try to get to as many as we can. Let's get started. I would like to introduce our first presenter from Triton Benefits, our very own CEO, Steve Rosenthal. Thanks, Melissa. Before we begin, I'd like to just do one or two polling questions just to get a handle of the audience. As, Ms., as Melissa mentioned on the questions, if you're having any problem seeing the screen and the audio, please let us know through the, uh, through the questions uh, panel. So our first poll is going to be a question regarding how many employees does your organization have? And this will give us a handle, again, in terms of the audience. It helps us with our presentation as well. Things are less relevant. We we won't speak about that uh, based on the size of the groups. So it looks like we're trending closer uh, between 26 to 100. I'm going to give it about another 10 seconds uh, with that 83% of the vote in. It's a great turnout. We have a... Uh, a lot of attendees today, so I thank you. I think you're going to learn a lot and be very informed with this presentation as we prepare for 2021. Okay, so yeah, we're about 30%, 26 to 100 uh, employees, about 30% of the group, and the next falls uh, 22%, 101 to 250. So uh, that's good. That That's what's anticipated. I'm going to close this uh, poll out, and just one more for now. And this lets us know what type of medical plans you have in place right now. The traditional fully insured plan, a level funded plan, self-funded, a captive insurance, or we don't currently offer group medical insurance. So we got about 60% of the vote in already. And it's always interesting to see how this comes because it's usually the same. You have about 60% that's fully insured, about 20% self and then all others for everything else. And we'll close this out as well. And again, it looks like 67 traditionally, 19% uh, self-funded. Okay, so a little bit uh, about the company. Uh, in 1998, 2001, we were one of the largest PEOs in the nation, and uh, the business was sold to Zurich Insurance at that time, ranked 231 on Forbes' list. Um, 
in 2008, 2014, became one of the largest uh, benefit outsourcing companies in the nation, serving over 600 clients and insuring over 50,000 employees. 2015, we became an ADP broker alliance partner. In 2017, we were ranked here in New Jersey as top three insurance brokers in terms of volume. And 2018, top 50 in terms of uh, volume in the nation. Uh, we manage over 400 million in annual premium, and also an authorized uh, ADP professional service vendor. So for the folks that use ADP or are about to use or may use ADP, we actually help with the implementation uh, as, as well. So what we're going to be discussing today are analytics and benchmarking tools analytics all over the colleges today it's all about info data so uh, we're going to you know talk about that and how we work that into the enrollment uh, traditional plans uh, with some key add-ons some self and level funded plans as well as uh, cost containment strategy that Tyler Hirsch is going to get into something uh, regarding captive insurance that's really uh, cool and, and, and uh, inviting and then Melissa is going to cap it off talking about using the latest benefit uh, technology and administration, and certainly in this day and age, how to uh, communicate virtually to your, your employees. So the first area I wanted to go to is analytics. And we, as I mentioned earlier, we spend a lot of uh, time with ADP and understand the ADP system, but there's a lot of systems of records today. Um, I know other payroll companies and folks that gather data that offer this type of information. Um, you know, one of the nice things about ADP is we get to benchmarking, and as brokers, we're able to utilize this across ADP's uh, clients and employees. So what you're looking on here is just pure enrollment. Uh, and this is a company, we you know, whited out the name, but this is real data. This is a company whose medical plan uh, enrollment is 69%, uh, and it's 14% lower than the ADP benchmark. The ADP benchmark calls for 83%, and this is showing 69%, so uh, a little low in terms of the overall enrollment. As far as the employer contribution is concerned, the benchmark looking at over 3,000 ADP clients, again, this is the wholesale trade in, uh, in the Northeast region that represents a half a million employees. And what the data is telling us here is that the employer contribution rate for medical plans is running at 69 versus 66%. So this is saying that it's higher than the benchmark. Uh, there's no analytical data on here in terms of the uh, ancillary benefits for dental and vision as well. I'm just I'm told to just try to make the screen a little bigger, so just bear with me for a moment. Okay. All right. Um, you know, right now we're working on trying to get the slideshow uh, to present a, um, a little larger. Hopefully you're able to see this all right. And so what this has shown us now is enrollment distribution across available coverages compared to uh, the respective industry benchmarks. So what this is telling us is that the ADP benchmark is saying 55% of the group uh, typically is going to be employee only, and here the group's running 75%. It gets interesting, though, when you go to the employee family. The employee family is showing an ADP benchmark that should represent closer to 22%. Here only 8.96 um, are showing up for the employee family, employee children. The benchmark's 11.76, only 8.5. Uh, and same thing, employee spouse, the benchmark is 10, showing 7. So while it's showing good enrollment for the employees, um, it's showing that we don't have as many the families and dependents. And that certainly could be attributed to uh, the, the way the contributions are, are scaled. Sometimes you'll see a company paying 80% for, say, single employee only, and then having a buy-up that could be as, as much as 100% uh, 
uh, and those rates could be you know quite steep. So that as you know, you look at this, and then you look at trends in terms of tenure and turnover could play a role as we get a little you know, more uh, data and look into this. So here we're looking at the average medical cost per enrolled employee is a little over four thousand. Um, and the benchmark is calling for seven thousand seven ninety eight per year. So this company is doing quite good. They're, they have a good broker. They're managing the cost. They um, saying it should be about seventy seven hundred per employee, running around four thousand uh, employees. So that also comes into consideration in terms of you know the type of plan. Is it an HSA? Uh, what are we doing to bring the, the cost down? Is it level funded, self funded, or displaced? It's very uh, typical. It could be in the captive program. So again, looking at a half a million companies and a cost for seven. Uh, 1,798, and this is running quite well from a cost perspective. We still have about 56.9% that do not want to be insured, um, and that, that's pretty high. And, you know, a lot of times that happens because of a blue-collar environment, um, or the rates just may be a little too high in their contributions. So sometimes you got to take a look at the salary and how that's structured. Uh, um, sometimes maybe a, a MEC plan could play a role in trying to get more people on the insurance so it's always a catch-22. You want to insure as many people as possible, uh, but you also want to control your cost, and you certainly want to get those waivers to get into your system of record as it relates to Forms 1094, 1095. I should have a couple of questions. I'm just going to look at the panel. And yes, we'll receive an email copy of the slide presentation. Okay. Let's close the panel. And we mentioned before about turnover. So the turnover rate for uh, employees, looking at the benchmark, the ADP benchmark should be about 2.86. Here, turning higher at 4.41. So uh, a couple things could be going on here. One, you know, certainly could be attributed to the uh, the rate of pay, and it could also be attributed to how many of these folks at the 4.41. Uh, are on family benefits and may find that a little too expensive, or maybe the waiting period is too long. When we go to the next slide and we take a look at the average tenure, uh, the average tenure looking at this over time is on the ADP benchmark 7.15 years the employees are staying in this sector, and this company is running 3.24. So again, I would look to go back uh, see if a lot of the turnover is for the non-singles, folks that have dependents, employees that have dependents, that may be paying too much money and going to the competition or looking elsewhere where the insurance is more affordable for them. So th this is good information to have. Uh, again, we get this information out of ADP analytics. There's m many different ways to get that, but today's day and age, everyone is looking at info data and, and, and analytics as uh, you know, um, information to help make insurance decisions. The next two slides really are more claim benchmarking, and there's companies out there, Truven, Zywave, Kaiser, that provide this data as well. So I'm gonna look at the one on the far right. Uh, we're just looking at emergency rooms, and for this company, um, their emergency room visits should be coming in somewhere in the ballpark, uh, according to the, the norm. Uh, somewhere around 32, 33,000. Instead, they're running closer to about 56,000. So they're about 23,000 over the norm, or 69%. Um, so there are things to do here, things to consider. This is clearly telling us that they're having a lot more visits per thousand. On the left should be 44. Actually, the norm should be about 37, running about 44. So how do we drive more people out of the emergency room and get them to urgent care and uh, uh, more of those types of places? So that's easy to control. It all comes down to dollars and cents when we're setting up the copays. And this just kind of gives you a bird's eye view of just you know some of the key indicators in terms of how your group's performing. I look at the big ticket item here, the inpatient uh, analysis, and the norm should be about 19,000, and this is running 28,000, so we're 41% too high in terms of inpatient. It's a lot of the carriers today, a lot of the TPAs today, we can do things to motivate uh, employees to start utilizing some of outpatient services. And so here we have what's favorable, what's not favorable, and on the, on the right bottom, you see that there's total claims 872,000, where only 328 was paid out. So that's going to show you good cost containment, good carry negotiations, and um, you know some co-pays and deductibles are in there. But for the most part, this really comes down to having you know a good network and good cost containment to bring these costs down. 
So again, these all are factors that come in when you're going out and you're reaching out to the carriers for your RFP process. And right now, right now the timing is good. You should be thinking about this around uh, around August, early early September at the latest. Uh, we have a lot of our clients even start this process uh, in, in, in July. So a couple of different approaches. Uh, a lot of companies don't realize that uh, many carriers, some of our uh, larger carriers, have international um, uh, offerings, and it's a different um, underwriting pool. Um, I know Aetna has a program out of Delaware, and so it's a whole different criteria. In this example, uh, again, I know the data is uh, kind of uh, small, and I wish I could blow this up a little bit. No, so I think I've got to stay the course on this. Uh, so what this is showing is that current plan is Oxford, also known as United, paying a little over a million dollars. The renewal is going to a million one thirteen, so about a hundred and six thousand dollar increase. And you can see these are EPO plans because in the non-network benefits, there's a, a not applicable. But uh, if you look at the plans, uh, you know you have one plan here that has a deductible of three thousand. And uh, you have a buy-up plan that has a, a looks like a 750 deductible. So when you map them over to the, the far right with an Aetna International plan, we see the rates come down significantly, 818 on the uh, on the annual cost. So it's about a hundred eighty-nine thousand dollar difference from current, and about a two hundred ninety-five thousand difference on renewal. And this is just taking a look. Does a company have? a office overseas it doesn't even have to be headquartered but if you have office overseas it could be basis to go into some of the international branches that looks at totally totally different underwriting data when making these decisions so just some good information to know as you uh, start to think about 2001 um, looking at more traditional the hsas with an hra caveat works out real well and what i wanted to show you in, in here and try to maybe focus a little bit is here you have you know two plans you have your renewal base plan and your renewal buy up plan <laughs> the one that's obsolete in the middle nobody signed up for and the premium uh, is annually at 376,207 and the um the um, renewal buy up going to 469061 so the culmination is uh, 845,269 and these two plans you have for the uh, base plan a $2,500 deductible, and you have your buy-up at at a thousand. Right. So when we look to come up with some alternative plans on the last two on the right, we kept it with Oxford uh, EPO as well, but we put in this HSA plan. So what happens with the HSA plan? It takes 845,000, it brings it to 731. Uh, 131,753. So that's 113,515 savings, or 13.43. And the only thing really changing on here is um, the deductible on the far left for the base plan is 2,500, and the, and the one for the second to the uh, end is also 2,500. But the difference is in the HSA, you have to satisfy that first before you can go see a doctor for your $30 copay or $20 copay uh, or get a prescription filled. So what we what made sense here is the savings is good, but the employees, uh, especially if there's a, a lot of turnover, you could get a mutiny. So on the right, what we did is we said, let's take the 30 singles, and you could do this with as many employees as you want. But here for this example, we took 30 singles. Uh, let's give them all a promise to pay at 500. And for the family, let's give them 1,000. We'll double it. So the company's allocating seventeen thousand. So if you take the full seven thirty one and the seventeen thousand, that's seven hundred and forty eight if every single person used the five hundred dollars and the thousand dollars. So what does that come out to be in terms of savings? It's basically eight forty five uh versus seven forty eight. What we do as a company, we guarantee the HRA at sixty percent utilization. So if it goes over sixty percent we take that portion. So it's really, uh, if you look at it from you know, dollars and cents, the company's obligation would, would be 10200 and we're pledging as the broker 6800 So we use that from our commissions, and the group would have to be really, really sick to use up all 100% of, of those funds. So if you look at it that way, the 748 becomes 741 versus the 845 saving $103,000 for a small group of 32 employees. That's not bad. 
Um, and actually, it's 54 employees when you look at the buy-up. But again, that's that's still very good, 103,315. And you're telling the employees that you go to a doctor, you have a, a debit card for 500, family 1,000 for the doctor for you know paying for some RX. And so that helps bridge the gap till you get to the 2,500. And at 2,500, the plan pretty much works the same way. So very good mechanism if you haven't thought about it yet. Very good mechanism to use as you start to I think about 2021 or future uh, enrollments. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a captive, but uh, first I want to just give the, the background and how these self-funded approaches uh, really work. So with the self-funded plans, you have some large TPAs in the country, third-party administrator. You have UMR, who is owned by United. You have Maritain, that's owned by Aetna. And then you have hundreds of agnostic ones, Allied, Core Source being a couple of larger ones. And basically, um, we say for a group of uh, a certain size, let's say 100 employees, we want to have a specific deductible of 40,000, uh, in this case, 40,000 even. Let's also take another look at an option for 50,000. So if any one individual puts in a claim, you know, more than 40000 the reinsurer is going to kick in. That reinsurer could be U.S. Life, HCC, uh, it could be a captive program. And, and so the cost for that 40000 if you look down a little bit, it's $251.82, and for the family, seven hundred four eighteen. So when you add up the whole group for that premium, it's almost a half, a little bit more than a half a million dollars, five hundred twenty-eight eight eighty-eight, to ensure that no claims go over $40,000. And what the reinsurer also does is they say, we're going to set a threshold. The overall plan will not go over one million two twenty two one fifty four, and if it does, we'll kick in again. So if we take the fixed cost, the five twenty eight, if we take the um, the aggregate of one million two twenty two and add those together, we're going to come up with one million six sixty two. And if that's less or in range of what your premium is today. The whole connotation, I don't want to do self-funded, it's too risky, I don't want to have to manage each month at a time. You know, you can get things called monthly accommodation where they spread it out and they're only going to take, uh, you know, one twelfth of the 1662 so you're not going to ever pay any more than that in a given month. First three months, you can have tremendous cash flow because you're not going to pay anything out. And what will happen is really the last three months when the plan closes out, in month uh, 13, 14, and 15, you'll start to see some of those claims that have been incurred but not reported start to come to fruition. So when there's a renewal, it, that usually gets taken into consideration. However, if you have a contract that's a 12, 15, it, it doesn't. You don't have any running claims. So the second year is going to be very advantageous for you. So again, this is just a little synopsis on how the self-funding works. But as you can see, a 528 is a big number for the fixed cost. Claims are the claims. We could put cost containment in. That title we'll talk about in a little while. But really, a great trend is how do we manage that 528? Can we do better? You know, is that a, is that just a fixed cost as it says, or could we own part of that as as a captive company? And really, the only other uh, thing is a, is a hybrid of your self-funded and your fully insured. It's it's level funded and. A couple of years ago, you just had a handful of carriers. With the exception of Blue Cross, just about every carrier is offering these plans. And so if you look at this, employee, 24 employees, um, for this group, 50,000 is built into the program. Any individual claim goes over 50,000. Um, call this Aetna's Alternative Funding Arrangement Level Funded Plan. Aetna doesn't charge the experience any more than 50,000. The cost for that, $197.30. Uh, to, to make sure the claims never go over X, and X here on the bottom per individual is 320.36. The aggregate premium on that is only $19.52. Nobody goes over it because it's typically a 25% corridor that's built in to that uh, that that, that uh, uh, potential liability, right? So. You know, basically, you have admin fees. Uh, that's to pay to process the claims. It's for commissions. It's to rent the network. And so you start adding up your fixed costs. Uh, it's 326. You're pre-funding at 320 for the claims. Uh, for the individual, it's it's 646. And that's how we you know get to that rate. On the top right, if we just look at it on a monthly basis, the stop loss premium is 15,601. Administrative costs 7,865. Claim pre-funding 23,000. So. That's how you get your your monthly premium of forty six you know thousand under a uh, level funded program, or if you multiply that by twelve, um, you know you'll get your you'll get your annual uh, as well. But if you just look at your twenty three thousand for the month, again multiply that by twelve, you're two hundred seventy six thousand for fixed cost. You know that's that's high. 
So um, again, there's there's ways to control it. What's nice about the level funded is you never pay any more than the 646 for the single that you see here on the bottom, the 1486 for the employee spouse. But if you start taking the claim prefunding, again the 23052 times 12 months at 276,000. If the claims come in at 200,000 in month 15, there's an accounting. Well, there's 76,624 in surplus. And in this case, Aetna would split that with you. Cigna has a program, they'd split it with you. United has a program called All Savers, they'd split it with you. So again, some of the advantage of being in a in more of a self-funded or a captive program, it's all yours, you don't, you don't split it. So it's a little hybrid. Um, and then really the only other thing I want to talk a little bit about is, um, you know, you've been seeing a lot of these um, medical programs over years and what we can do to contain. This this one is, is pretty easy. This is life insurance. I'm not going to get into LTD or critical illness, but I just wanted to share something. Um, so use, you know, 24 employees in this case, but you can use 100 and just multiply, you know, by, by four to give you an idea. So... Years ago, you'd give your employees $10,000 life insurance as an inducement. Uh, you know, it wasn't much of an inducement. It really came down to burial insurance. So a lot of companies now said, you know what? We're going to put in our benefit package $100,000 life insurance. We're going to give it to all of our employees. And the cost of that's uh, 7.9 cents per thousand. So if you multiply that by 24 employees, you've got a volume of 2.4 million times 7.9 cents. It cost us $189 per month to give your staff 100000 And what that also does, because you've created a baseline plan, it now allows the employees to buy up. And so now you eliminate the participation requirements and you have a, a, a low premium on the cost to do so. So you take somebody that's 44 years old um, that wants, uh, let's say, uh, you know, an additional 500000 it's only $48 a month. And part of it is you as an employer are subsidizing it because you're giving the carrier, you know, some additional revenue called the base plan at 100,000 per employee. And also you have evidence of insurability where, you know, to get an additional 100,000, there's no questions asked. Going up, you know, up to, you know, a million dollars, you can go do that. And there's uh, no no test, no blood work. You're just, uh, you know, filling out a simplified questionnaire for that. Um, so the more you make your base, the easier it gets in terms of the voluntary, uh, you know, portion of, of these buy-up plans. So again, it's a nice benefit to put into your portfolio and to put into your, your benefit guide. So with that said, I want to talk a little bit about cost containment. Uh, again, as brokers, we certainly can go to Aetna and play Aetna off the United and play United off of Blue Cross, but eventually that story gets old, right? There's just so many carriers you can, you can go to. So, um, you know, a strategy to look at this over the long haul and manage single digits uh, Tyler Hirsch, who is a, a senior VP over at Pareto, one of the largest um, uh, captive insurers in the country, is going to talk a little bit about his program. Go ahead, Tyler. Sounds good. Thanks, Steve. And, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us this afternoon. I just want to double check. Steve, can you hear me? I can. 100%. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, uh, as Steve mentioned, um, my name is Tyler Hirsch. I'm a regional VP here at, at Pareto Health, and we run a, a captive uh, program. Uh, and really, all the all a captive is, and I just want you to kind of keep this in the back of your mind for anybody who hasn't heard that term before. Uh, a captive is really just a, a a different risk financing vehicle, just like uh, a fully insured plan or a self insured plan or a level funded plan is uh, as Steve just covered uh, in, in the previous slides. Um, but before I jump into it, you know, I think it's important to recognize where we are and how we got here. Um, so I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time on, on the current healthcare market and what the majority of employers are facing. Uh, and that is, uh, you're really being held at the mercy of the very large insurance carriers, the Blue Crosses, the United Healthcares, the Cigna's, the Aetna's out there. Um, and they control a majority of the market. Uh, and more and more, they're controlling different levers inside of the healthcare supply chain uh, than they ever have before. Um, they're coupling that along with the messaging that they've been telling employers for the last 20 some years, and that is to treat healthcare and health insurance in a 12 month mindset, right? Every kind of 10 months, we're gonna come out with a renewal we're gonna give you that renewal, probably starting somewhere around high single digits up to 15 to 20%. Uh, and then we're gonna do this dance where you come back to me and say you have quotes from another competitor 
and I'm going to drop my rates. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, we're going to settle on a number, call it a day, and then, you know, in 10 months, you'll hear from me again. Uh, and and again, I'm going to come to you and tell you what your renewal is, and, and there's really not going to be much data behind that uh, or any data at all. Um, and that's kind of the story that they've been telling, uh, and it's been very effective and it's been very profitable for their businesses. Um, in reality, Steve, if you could jump to the next slide, uh, there is a long-term strategy, long-term approach that you can take to managing your healthcare uh, costs and your health insurance costs. Um, and the way to do that is really treating your health insurance and your healthcare costs just like you do every other part of your business. Uh, treat it in a three, five, 10 year time frame, and stop managing it in short little intermediate cycles of 10 to 12 months and being held at the mercy of the insurance carrier. Uh, in order to do that, you need to go into a program that provides you one with security. Um, and with our type of program, what we're able to do is bring what's called the strongest stop loss contract or the st strongest catastrophic insurance policy in the market to our members and, and to our clients. Um, in addition to that, as we kind of fix the first component of health insurance, which is the risk financing component, we're able to turn our attention to the bigger slice of the pie in your overall health insurance costs or health care costs. And that is to smaller predictable claims uh, that you can actually drive down utilizing different cost containment tools. Uh, inside of our program, we give you access to a number of tools that you can easily turn on when you want to, to improve benefits for your employees while at the same time driving down costs in the immediate and the long term. Uh, and at the same time, inside of our captive program, you're actually going to create a community or a healthcare peer group where you're going to get to meet other HR directors, controllers, uh, CEOs, CFOs who are in your same position. Uh, all throughout the country, maybe in your same industry, maybe not, uh, but most likely the same size segment that you're in today. Uh, and you're going to hear from them, learn from them on what they're doing to affect their healthcare costs and how they're achieving results uh, that they've achieved inside of our program. Um, so, Steve, if you could click to the next slide. Um, the important part to recognize is that when you are in the fully insured market today, what's happening is you're just taking a lump sum. I'm just gonna use round numbers for this example. You know, say you're a 100 life employer, you're taking a million dollars and you're handing it over to United Healthcare. Um, as I mentioned before, what happens is about 10 months after your effective date, United Healthcare turns around and gives you a renewal. They might give you a little data with that, or they might give you some anecdotes and say, hey, you have some large claimants or you've had a, 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 a big claims year. Uh, so we're going to give you a 15% increase. Now that's a 15% increase on your entire pool of $1 million with no supporting data, no transparency backing up why that increase is actually taking place or where your million dollars went throughout the year. Um, when you become self-funded, as Steve mentioned, or even level funded, you're starting to break apart that system and only starting to pay for what you're using. Uh, and that is the key to a long-term strategy is to buy as little insurance as possible and only pay for what you're using. So that's where the captive comes in and why we refer to it as a risk financing vehicle. It is a way to buy catastrophic insurance and then just pay for your claims as they come in. Um, so the, uh, the way the captive functions is that we are going to pool um, risk together with other midsize employers uh, all throughout the country and when an employer has a large claim, we're gonna pay for that large claim together. Each employer is responsible for their own small claims up to a certain dollar amount. Uh, in this example, I'll just use $30,000 as that example. So what would happen in our program is that each employer pays the first $30,000 of claims. Uh, anytime they have a claimant go over $30,000, that large claim is then pooled and paid for out of a pool uh, and in doing so, what you're able to do is we're taking mid-size employers, you know, whether they're 50 life employers, 100 life, 300 life employers, and we're combining them together with other like-minded employers and 
essentially creating a 30, 40,000 life company so that when a large claim comes in, you can withstand that large claim together as a pool, as opposed to having extreme volatility year over year that many employers would, would see if they were self-funded on their own. Um, and what the fully insured employers are getting is you're able to break apart that system and only pay a small portion of fixed costs for that catastrophic insurance and pay for those smaller claims as they come in. Uh, and anytime they don't have those small claims, that money stays in your pocket. It never leaves your company and it's your money. It stays in, and improves your cash flow. Uh, Steve, if you could click forward one, one slide. Um, and what's important to remember is that that catastrophic insurance component is, is only really about 30% of where your dollars go in this type of strategy. So where the majority of your dollars are gonna go, 65, 70% of your total healthcare dollars are going to those smaller predictable claims. Uh, and what you're able to do in taking a long-term outlook is start to use some cost containment tools and specifically when it applies to Pareto, those tools are built into our program. So what you see here on this slide it are programs such as COBRA and Medicare advocacy programs, data analytics tools, um, cancer care, direct contracts with surgical networks, labs, imaging centers all throughout the country that you would then have access to and make available to your employees. Uh, so you have the ability to improve benefits for your employees by saying, you can go to a direct contracted surgical center for the same knee surgery that you might go to the local hospital system for, but because you're going to this direct contracted surgical center, uh, we know it's gonna be lower cost. So what we'll do is we'll waive your copay, we'll waive your deductible, and we'll incentivize you to go to that surgical center because we know they have very good outcomes, very low readmission rates, and you're gonna be back to work faster. So it's really a win-win on both, both sides. Uh, while at the same time, the employee maintains all the flexibility that they would have in the traditional PPO network. Uh, so what I mean by that is, is when I say we're improving benefits by, by maintaining the flexibility, it truly is a, a type of program that sits side by side with a, you know, call it a Cigna or an Aetna PPO network that your employees still have access to. Um, so all of these tools are available inside of our program. Uh, and they come included with membership into the captive. Uh, Steve, if you could click forward. Um, what I wanted to share with everybody is just an example uh, here of an employer that's been with us since 2016. Uh, they joined the captive uh, coming from being fully insured with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Uh, they are a manufacturer. Uh, they have just over 90 enrolled employee lives and they were paying in 2016 just north of $700,000. So what we're illustrating here is on the red line is their fully insured premium in 2016. And if you just trend that up at 6% per year, which I think you know a lot of people on this call might look at 6% as an increase to a fully insured premium and say, hey, I'd take that every single day. Uh, what, what this employer realized is that there was no real justification for that 6% increase. While it's nice and it is a low number, um, you know, there's nothing to back it up. So we're handing over you know, 700 plus thousand dollars to Blue Cross and Blue Shield. They're turning around and giving us a 6% increase with no justification for that. Uh, so they decided to break out of that mold, join the captive program. And the blue line you see there is what their actual expenses were all in after they joined the program. So Steve, if you could click forward one more. Uh, what you see here is that breakdown of their, their actual spend in the captive compared to what they would, would have spent if they would have stayed fully insured. Uh, and I think what's important to recognize here is that they improved their, their cash flow. They obviously had close to half a million dollars of savings over four years. But if you look at those numbers, they never paid uh, what they would have paid in that first year back in 2016 if they had stayed fully insured. They got close to it in their third year in the captive in 2018, uh, but they never paid that, that full $716,000 number that they would have paid had they stayed fully insured. And that is, you know, just to go along with the theme that, that I mentioned early when I started you know, my part here, is that 
it, it really is kind of a cycle, you know, merry-go-round Ferris wheel uh, that really creates compound interest for the insurance carriers, where you kind of stay on this kind of stepping path or staircase path, where each year your, your premiums slowly go up. Some years they jump by 10%, some years they only go up 5%, some years they jump 20%. And what, what you'll see is that each year, that renewal stacks on top of itself and just keeps growing over time and building revenue, building profit for that insurance carrier. And in this type of program, where you take a long-term approach and you implement cost containment strategies, you're able to drive your cost down over time, only pay a small portion in fixed costs for your insurance and pay the larger variable component as those claims come in and realize those savings immediately for your company. Um, so the last slide here that I have uh, is really just a snapshot of what this employer did year over year in the captive. Uh, a lot of times when we go through this example, a lot of people will will roll their eyes and say, oh, well, they must have completely blown up their plan, caused huge disruptions for their employees, and really instituted a real strict policy that didn't have great benefits. And in reality, all they did was move away from Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they partnered with a third-party administrator called Meritain to access the Aetna National Network. They, they kept their co-pays the same, they kept their deductibles, they kept their plan summaries the same, uh, and simply changed the financing aspect of how they were paying for their health insurance. Uh, in addition to that, they accessed a few of the programs that are built into the, to the captive in, in the prescription drug manager carve out, so they received 100% of the drug rebates. They started to be able to access their own data through Springbuck, which is our data analytics partner, so that they could get a true picture of their claims, of their demographics, really where are, where are our dollars going? And once you are able to identify where your dollars are going, you can start to identify gaps in care and where future large claimants might come from. Uh, and what you can do with that data is get ahead of it. You can start to put in programs that are gonna have real ROI for you, as opposed to taking a shot in the dark with a wellness program that may or may not work and drive down your costs. Um, and then what you see in years two and years three is that they build up, built upon what they did in that first year to continue to improve benefits, continue to access the tools that are available to them and paid for out of the captive membership uh, to help to drive down that cost over time. So that is that is my my portion here talking about cost containment and long term strategy. And, and the last piece that I'll just leave leave everybody with is, uh, you know, don't be stuck in the mindset uh, that the insurance carriers have been kind of feeding you and telling you for the last five, 10, 20 years here. And that is that you have no control and there's nothing you can do to control costs of healthcare uh, because the claims are going to come in regardless. Uh, while that might be partially true, where your claims are going to come in regardless, your employees are going to go to the doctor, your employees are going to have babies, they're going to have surgeries, just know that there are tools out there for your employees to access and for you to utilize as an employer to truly manage your healthcare costs over a long-term time period, just like you do other every other aspect of your business. Um, so that's my portion, and I'll, I think I'm turning it over to Melissa at this point. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tyler. Really appreciate that. And thank you, Steve. I think, you know, going forward, I mean, we learned a lot about, you know, Steve talked to us about how important analytics and benchmarking is to, to the business and some different, you know, strategies when it comes to health insurance and just the latest trends. You know, it's, it's not always just fully insured. It's always good to look what else is out there, you know, from yourself and your level funded plans, as well as what Tyler was talking about with a cost containment strategy with a captive. You know, sometimes that word could be a little scary, but it's always good to do your due diligence and look and benchmark what else is out there and how you can help your company save money. So now I'm going to move into a little bit about um, more of the virtual open enrollment environment and tying in the technology and how that really is going to play into this new world, you know, this unprecedented um, times that we're living in because of COVID. So once the client comes on board with Triton, our team immediately gets to work. You know, we, I'm sorry, like the picture. So take a look at that. Who do you, who can say who that is? Is that Jimi Hendrix, right? 
the left-handed genius. There's one thing that we know about Jimi Hendrix. Um, he's awesome at what he does. And I think this picture has a lot of symbolism to it. He can play that guitar without even looking at it. So what we're trying to portray here is at, as a benefits broker, we can do the same for you when it comes to your open enrollment. And the first thing that we like to do is create an internal team. So we work with your management team to understand kind of what's going on, what, what, what the structure is like, what your culture is like. And we also understand all the plans, your contributions, your eligibility, eligibility groups. We also prepare a virtual walkthrough that you can send to your employees. I think that's really critical. Communication right now is so is so critical to employee success and understanding of health of your health strategy. Um, we also want to make sure that from an IT and payroll standpoint that your systems are built out properly. And carriers, you want to make sure that you have a lot of connectivity with your carriers because as we know, um, you know, like Tyler was talking about cost containment, one of the biggest areas for, some, you know, gaps within, or, within an organization comes from your benefits area. So we want to make sure that that is completely built out and, um, and taken care of for you. Steve, you want to go to the next slide? So as I mentioned, during these unprecedented times, we recognize that not everyone responds to the same type of communication, which is why it's important that we provide multiple platforms for your employees. Whether it's a broker chat, we have found in the last couple of months how critical this is to our business. It encourages your employees, and not only just your employees, but the families to actually chat with us, to talk to us about your concerns. At the end of the day, we wanna make sure that everybody is comfortable and they understand the benefits that are put out in front of them. Um, we find um, we could either set up with a call center, we could do a one-on-one, -on -one. there's a multitude of ways or email, whatever your employees are comfortable with, we make sure that we will help them through that process. Uh, from a presentation standpoint, we do recorded webinars. Uh, we find um, these open enrollment in this virtual world that we're living in, you know, we'll make sure that we record them. So if you have somebody that can't attend that day, we have that recorded webinar for them to listen to at their convenience. We also do the guided tours. So we make sure that whatever technology that they're going to be utilizing, that they understand how to actually enroll in the technology and to kind of finish out that open enrollment moment. Um, additionally, we'll um, provide an um, you know, open enrollment guide, which is a very, very detailed, thank you, Steve, for going to the next slide. Um, an open enrollment guide is, you know, not only will we put that within your technology on your portal, we also give a hard copy of this. So this is one of those instances where we utilize technology and we go back a little old school to provide that, you know, you, you need that actual document to feel and look through and thumb through all the pages because they tend to be a little lengthy in size. Um, and this, uh, what you see on your screen right now, is something that we do for all of our clients. And if you would like a copy of what we provide, per perhaps your broker is not providing you something that's comprehensive, we are happy to provide you with a copy of our um, open enrollment guide that you can customize. Feel free to reach out to us um, after this webinar for a copy of that. Okay, so now talking about from a technology standpoint, uh, it is extremely important that the technology that you're utilizing, whether it's ADP technology, whether it's um, ease, whatever, whatever technology you're utilizing today, uh, it is extremely important that everything is built out in its entirety. So what I mean by that, so all your plans need to be loaded in, um, and, and there's a reason why I'm saying that everything needs to be built out, because the output needs to be um, the open enrollment process. So this is just a sample on your screen right now of what the ADP technology looks like. And it goes into everything from your self-service, your plan detail, comparisons, flow consideration, exceeding of guaranteed issue, um, all of these good things. And as a broker and an ADP partner, we do all of this for our clients. We take that extra step to relieve the burden from your HR team of loading all of this information into your technology so that way they can focus on what they do best and we take that burden off their, off their shoulders. And going a little bit deeper into that ADP technology, Steve, can you go to the next slide? 
This is just a quick snapshot of a couple of the different screens from the ADP system. Now, just so you know, we are agnostic when it comes to technology. I'm just using this as an example, but we certainly will work with whatever technology that you have and assist you in you know, setting up your benefits portal. So as an example, um, with this snapshot of ADP, just so you get an idea of what the breakdown of you know loading things in and how long it takes us, it's about four to six hours between you know data gathering, uh, loading and building out all the medical dental and vision plans, your plan comparisons, all of that good stuff, and your employment profile. That takes our team about four to six hours, um, and we do that. We don't charge for that. That's just something that we do as your broker. Steve, you want to go to the next slide? And as I mentioned earlier, how important it is to have that technology and have that built out, this is why. You want to, the number one, um, you know, in these times, as I talked about the different ways that we're going to reach your employees, people love technology and they love it on their phone. Mobile technology is so important to incorporate in your open enrollment strategy. I mean, think about it in our daily life. How easy is it just to pick up your phone if you need to, um, you know, if you need to make an election, if you need to manage your address, whether it's, you know, you want to actually enroll in the benefits, how great would it be if you could just pick up your phone and, and, and load in whatever, whatever kind of, you know, election that you have, any kind of guidance that you need. Everything is right here at your fingertips. We try to make it as convenient as possible. So, okay. Okay, so in addition to ADP, we also utilize a system called Ease, um, and I think it was named that just because it really is so easy to, um, to navigate and use. It's a wizard-based system, and this is you know, this is in the event that maybe you're the technology that you're using today doesn't even have an open enrollment tool. You don't have anything. If that is the case and, you, and we are your broker, we provide this technology to you that you can use. And again, this is something that our team, we are fully versed in this technology. We understand how to load in the plan. So we would do all that heavy lifting for you. And Ease is one of the largest uh, enrollment companies companies in the country and we you know we utilize this you know on, on a when you don't have any kind of technology we'll take care of this for you all right does anybody have any questions Steve you might have to tell me because I don't see anything yeah most before you the questions if you don't mind I just want to do one uh, last uh, polling that'll uh, help us out a little bit here um, so just uh, give me one second, and then we'll get to the Q and A. And we know what it's like to receive emails and communication and so forth. So, um, you know, rather than continue to send you stuff that you may not find useful, we just wanted to kind of get a handle if you want us to continue keeping you educated and sending you uh, information what's going on in the insurance world. As a company, we, we speak and do a lot of webinars and speak, you know, a lot of benefit publications. We're uh, uh, an author in a lot of the publications. So we are stay on track in, in D.C. and in the various states on what's going on in, in your neck of the woods. And uh, we've got about 40% uh, of the voting. I'm just going to give this about another uh, few seconds. I do see um, a question that... Uh, that that came in from Lewis, and Lewis wants to know: Do you need to put up any upfront money to be in a captive? I think this one's for you, Tyler. Um, do you get a dividend for your good claim experience on the stop loss? So let me just close this uh, poll out, and then Tyler, if you want to take that, I think that would be helpful. And uh, okay. Yeah. So um, so Lewis, thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is is yes. There is a capital component associated with joining the the captive. Think of it as your your fee into the club. Uh, what what a group can expect is to contribute 10% of their stop loss premium into the in in capital to join the captive and become a member. Uh, and what that translates to is that in reality, as I mentioned, about 30% of your total costs go to uh, the, the fixed cost of that stop loss premium. So if you're spending a million dollars today fully insured, you can expect your stop loss premium to probably be about $300,000. Uh, 
And so what you would be looking at is putting up $30,000 of capital to join the captive. Now that capital is treated as a long-term asset on your balance sheet. Uh, it's held in a separate account with your name on it. And if you were to ever leave the captive, that capital account flows back through to you and goes with you. It's not something that Pareto gets to keep or, or stays with the captive. It's your own money and that would flow back through to you. In putting up that capital, you are becoming an equity owner in the program. So you, you would reap all the benefits of the underwriting profits for when the captive ran well. So your question around a dividend is that, yes, there are dividends that are produced in the captive. And when the captive runs well, what you would see is that dividend would flow back through to you and go into that capital account. And that would be your money. Tyler James also asked a similar question on that. He asked, uh, explain the process in terms of um, the captive. How long uh, does the funds remain in there before, uh, before it's trued up? Yeah. So uh, James, I take it you're you're most likely familiar with the cap with a captive on the property casualty and workers comp side. Um, and what I would say is that a, a medical captive or benefits captive is similar. Uh, where they differ is in that tail of how quickly a program year finishes out, where a workers' comp captive can uh, you know, go on for a number of years. Uh, a, a medical group captive generally has a program uh, year inside of around 18 months. So what you would see is that the, the first year that you join, say you join January 1, uh, you would see that program year end in June of the following year. So it's about an 18 month time frame per program in the captive to when that program year would, would close out. Great, thanks Tyler. Uh, Ella, Ella has a question. It uh, says, what is the timetable to start this process for a January 1 renewal date? Um, I'll, I'll take this one. I would tell you that the analytics uh, review and survey should begin uh, August to the beginning of September. Um, the review of the census and loss information and planned strategy to be done for uh, preparation for the RFP uh, should be sent out by September 15th. The RFP results in by September 30th. Um, typically, you want to be making some type of decision by around September 15th to the end of September. Build out the technology for the open enrollment around uh, October 1st. And then by uh, November uh, 6th or so, uh, actually, October 15th through around November 6th, you want to start that open enrollment period, validate the data sent to the carriers by November 15th, and the carriers to supply ID cards uh, and get everyone in the system by December 15th, and then the build out into the payroll system and carrier connections uh, by December 31st. So that's typically just rule of thumb. Uh, you know, when you're you're looking at these one one renewals, obviously, if you have a tighter schedule, you reduce some of these windows a little bit. But this would be kind of best best in class. Um, Marinella indicates uh, or asks a question: What's the best way to capture data and and benchmarking? And uh, I would I would say that uh, you know we ADP being that they pay one out of every five or six Americans, they have the benchmarking data. Um, so we like utilizing that system. Also, if um, someone does not make us the broker and they want us to gather the ADP analytics data, we have the ability to do that by just signing a simple form and it gives us, it's like an NDA and it gives us access to provide uh, analytical data for you. Even if we're not the broker, we don't mind doing that uh, as, as well, Marinella. So uh, yeah, feel free to, uh, to to reach out. So we're, we're just uh, touching the hour here. Um, you know, at this point, I'd like to conclude our session entitled 2021 Open Enrollment Season and let you know this webinar will be on our company website tomorrow by 5 p.m. under the resource section. You can also email us at tina.friedman, F-R-E-E-D-M-A-N, at Triton HRO, or call our office for a free benefit guide template, as Melissa uh, was indicating earlier. I'd like to thank our presenters, Tyler Hirsch from Pareto and Melissa Cook from Triton Benefits, for, for presenting today. And I would also like to thank all of you for attending today's webinar. Have a great day. Thank you.